So for context, this is a comment left in the video about a needlessly edgy player. Guess that guy wasn't the only one who experienced this. Yeah, this guy reminds me of the bard we had in the party, who claimed in life that he murdered millions of people in the rebellion. We had to tell him no, because there was no way anyone in the party would want to work with, you know, a mass murderer. Oh, and his sisters and mothers were- <laughs> ah, It's like clockwork! He tried to force it too, while in-game, without the DM's consent. Hey, dude, um, I still need your backstory for our D&D game. We're starting in, like, a couple days, so it's- Pretty urgent that I get it soon-ish. Oh yeah, I emailed it to you a while back. Oh, sick. Sorry, I haven't been checking my email for- <laughs> This looks like an NSFW Goblin Slayer fanfic. Did you send me the right- Did. I. Stutter? I, I mean, technically, you, you didn't stutter at all because you, you, you didn't say anything. You emailed- <laughs> it. That was the last straw, and he got pulled away and booted. I wouldn't call it a perfect ending, but I would call it the good ending to a situation like this. At least you never had to play with this guy. Look, if you want NSFW content in your campaign, that's cool. But you need to make sure everyone is 100% A-OK -okay with it. Because if they're not, it really doesn't land, man. Thanks so much for sharing all these horror stories. Thank you so much for watching. It helped me a lot as a player and dungeon master, and I thought to share a horror story of my own. I play in an online group with six players and our dungeon master, the accidental horror part of the story. The players are me, the Fey Warlock, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Sorcerer, and Wizard. So we have five full casters and a fighter. We are reaching the last part of our arc, as some cultists were trying to revive their god, a homebrew snake thing or the like. Wait a minute. Five people with magical powers. One person without magical powers. Fighting an ancient snake god? It's the first season of the Jago! I think I just said way more about myself than I ever intended to. So anyway, we arrived at this ritual. Combat ensued. Turn one, there is an anti-magic shield placed in the ritual, a problem for our almost full caster party. Luckily, we still had a fighter to stop it, and he's charmed by one of the cultists, and due to some horrible rolls and having minus one on wisdom, stays that way for more than half of the fight. So now, with almost no way of stopping the ritual, the Serpent King gets revived. For the last session of the arc, and to face this epic god, we all got temporary, amazing boons from the Dungeon Master. The Cleric got level 9 spells from their god, the Dragonborn Sorcerer got turned into a full-blown dragon, the Fighter changed into an avatar of the god they worshipped, and I got my Archfey Patron on my side with an appropriate spell list and slots. For people who don't know, Archfey Warlocks get charms and illusions, something I leaned heavily into. The battle was going well, everyone did major damage, and then it was my turn. I tried to charm the snake god. Apparently, it's immune to being charmed, but no problem, still half a spell list to use. Next round, I tried to make our fighter invisible to help him, but the god is true sight. So with most of my spell list being completely useless, there was nothing I could really do except use polymorph to burn legendary resistances, while everyone else dealt 100 damage per round. So for the two final battles of the arc, my character was... Basically useless. For you, I give the axe of eternal winter. Thank you, my lady. Its edge will fell even the strongest of foes, no matter what realm they come from. I will cherish it with my life. For you, I give the lantern of first light. Oh, wow. Th thank you. What does it do? Its fire will burn away near any enemy. That that sounds amazing, but I mean, we're, we're, we're going against, you know, uh, a fire drake that breathes fire and is made of fire, so is it going to be useful? Even in those dark hours, the light will give your friends encouragement in battle and show your way even in the darkest of places, even if its flames cannot touch certain foes. So what you're saying is this thing is useless? Look, there's a lot of you! I'm running low on gifts, okay? It wasn't all bad. The session was action-packed, and I got to send nine sendings to the leader of the cult who escaped, and got to ridicule him, and the DM apologized for the bad balancing. I'm still in the group, and the dungeon master has learned to balance his encounters better for everyone's needs, 
Thanks for listening to slash reading my rant. You know, sometimes DMs mess up. I messed up two days ago. The comments of my last Q&A are just roasting the crap out of me for giving my barbarian a hammer instead of the sword that he wanted, which you know what? Not unreasonable. My point is everybody messes up. I think this is a pretty big mess up, all things considered, because it's at the end of the arc and all that. But this dungeon master did apologize. That is the big thing. And the DM is learning to balance better for the future. I think it is bad form to make a boss just immune to everything a player does. There are effects in my games that can completely shut down a character. For example, our barbarian who I mentioned earlier, he can get completely shut down if I use the dazed condition on him. There are ways for him to work around it, but it can be pretty demoralizing for his character, so I need to do that conservatively and give him other options in combat. Like for example, because daze essentially stops him from moving, give him melee adds to focus on when the boss moves away from him. Small things like that can make a huge difference. Okay, this one really stings. After my last D&D game, I lost all of my miniatures. I've looked up and down for all of my PC minis, but they've completely vanished. I really wish there was a place I could order truly one-of-a-kind minis, but alas, I've had no luck. <sighs> At least until I found Bard Song. This video is sponsored by Bard Song and their brand new Kickstarter now out, which includes some of the best miniatures I have ever seen. Six heroically painted heroes ready for immediate play. But these aren't just any miniatures. These are modular miniatures. Using a very cool magnetic system, you can use over 50 accessory options, 30 plus handheld items, including weapons, spell effects, and everyday items, and 20 plus meticulously crafted head sculpts. Immediately upon taking these out of the box, I was so impressed with the quality of the paint job and how gorgeous each and every model was. But the coolest thing they sent me was this handcrafted wooden magnetic D&D character sheet. This thing is so awesome. It works perfectly with the minis themselves, acting as a sort of storage system, but on top of that, it is a perfect way to display all of your stats in such a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing way. Man, I'm not even talking about the villains they sent me, including this gorgeous succubus and this incredible dragon rider. If you guys don't check this out, I think you're missing out. If you guys are interested, you can head down into the description down below to the Bard Song Kickstarter so you can pre-order these incredible enhancements to your TTRPG game. As always, supporting our sponsors does support us. Thank you so much to Bard Song for sponsoring this portion of today's video. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn back into an animated rat so that we can get back to the video. Several years ago, I took over a game from a friend of mine. He was extremely casual about everything and let the players get away with a lot. I suspected something was up when a player came up to me and said, Hey, look at this character I rolled. The stats were 18, 18, 18, 16, 15, 14. He got offended when I expressed disbelief that he legitimately rolled that. Also, the old DM had apparently just let them roll and witness for each other. Now, I suspect that the D6s being used were cheat dice, since they came up with a ridiculous amount of sixes in game. People wanted to roll with them, saying they were lucky dice, all the players would use them, but the DM had a separate set. Okay. Pause. I've never had lucky dice because, you know, that's not how statistics work, but at the same time, my players have recently boycotted Google Dice Roller. All my players are always rolling high on this thing. When I finally tried it out, I realized, oh my god, this thing is kind of crazy, except when it isn't, in which case it rolls really stupid low. Is it a thing? Do you guys experience the same thing? Anyway. I took over DMing with this lucky group and they continued the characters and campaign they had, but when it came time to start a new campaign, I expressed my dislike for stat rolling systems and said after 9 years of DMing, I decided to stick to point by only. I had my reasons for this, but the main one was the fairness. I didn't like one person having a better character just based on something as fickle as luck. Highly agree! Full respect to people who do like systems like that, but Crispy does approve. As bummed as a few of them were, they all agreed, especially since I'd be allowing them the most points allowed. Then, the wolf, as I'll call him, he was at the table with my other friend, who I'll call the samurai. He was still rolling dice and was exclaiming, finally, yes, an 18, while the samurai watched. He wrote on his paper and had two sets of stats written down. They looked like this, 18, 16, 16, 7, 7, 7, 18, 17, 17, 14, 13, 12. I looked at the first one and said, You dumped like three stats, are you playing a fighter type? And he said, Oh, I'm not using that. I asked, Then how do you want to spend it? I can help you. He then responded, No, I rolled my character, here it is, pointing at the second set. The samurai watched me. This was after I'd said I wouldn't be allowing rolled characters, and everyone, including him, had agreed. 
I said, I told you, we're doing point by. He responded, I don't care, it's not enough. This is the character I rolled. The samurai watched me. This is what I'm playing. I responded, you can't play with that. He retorted, either you let me play with this, or I won't play. He didn't play in that campaign. It's over, Layton. We've tested your weighted dice. You can't lie to us anymore. No, it's not over. What are you gonna do about it, huh? We have the evidence. Well, because I'm making an ultimatum. Whoa! Okay, okay, okay. C calm down. Calm down, man. If you don't let me use my cheat character in this Dungeons and Dragons game, I will leave the room peacefully. Oh! Well... Man, I really thought that would work. While the wolf refused to play under me after that, we eventually did play together, but under the samurai in a homebrew Star Wars game, that really was a heck of a lot of fun. Well, I started DMing early on, 3.5 was my first experience. I gave the characters all kinds of stuff. Monster races, high stats, magic items galore. It was fun temporarily, like playing a game with cheat codes. When I decided to run a more balanced style, weaning them off of it, it was hard. Oh, and it was confirmed to me in the end, yes, they were cheat dice. I wonder how that conversation went. It's hard to get cheaters to admit that they're cheating sometimes. Like, did you do a full H-Bomber guy style video to expose the guy in front of all his friends? Probably not, but it's a funny image. The point is, cheating is dumb. You shouldn't do it. We've talked about this multiple times. And also, if you are told to roll a character in a certain way, you need to roll the character in that way, including if the DM tells you not to roll at all. There is nothing more frustrating than telling someone something, the guy agrees to do it, and then the dude just changes his mind five seconds later. That is so annoying. Please don't do that. I am glad that in the end you did have fun with this person, though I am sorry you needed to deal with their character creation BS. I've been watching your videos for a while, since way back when you had the Skyrim footage in the background. Whew, dang, that takes me back. God, I spent more time working on that mod list than anything else, and getting that footage was pretty much the only time I played Skyrim, because by that point I'd already gotten burnt out and tired of replaying Skyrim over and over again. Oh, man, nostalgia is a hell of a trip. I love your content, but I never really thought I'd be typing up a story of my own. This one is more on the milder side, but in any case, let's go on to the important people in the story. Myself, playing an artificer, the dungeon master, our dungeon master, pretty cool dude, invited me to his ongoing campaign, Rochambeau, playing a ranger, another cool guy, old head, pretty funny too. Dice is the party's cleric, another old head, my favorite player in the group. Bob played a barbarian, I wouldn't call him a that guy, but he was definitely somewhat of a problem player. There were plenty of other players at our table, but they didn't really do anything noteworthy outside of just playing the game. So the story starts when my old D&D group fell through due to scheduling issues. We are pretty far into our campaign, playing for a bit over three years, although we did have some issues in our group, we still enjoyed playing Dungeons & Dragons together, but after a while of not having a weekly game, I needed to get my dice rolling fix. So I went to my local game store to see if they had any games running there. I was kind of nervous going in with all the horror stories I've heard that take place at said game stores, but all of that went out the window when I saw the dungeon master running the store. We used to work together for a time, and we talked about D&D all the time. So when I came to him looking for a game, he invited me to his ongoing drop-in, drop-out campaign. Now the thing was that it was paid D&D, which I was a bit apprehensive about. I wonder why. Alright, so it looks like you take around... 52 points of damage? With, with that much damage, that's gonna take my character way below zero hit points. Oh, does, does that mean that your little character is... Dead! Yeah, they're dead. This is the first combat, dude. Oh, well, looks like you're gonna need to roll up another one. Okay, hold on. On the first combat, you killed my character. Uh-huh. You've completely disregarded my backstory. Well, it always seemed like a little bit of a waste of time. Most of the players haven't even shown up. You know, I mean, I could always just post on r slash LFG at some point. This game just absolutely sucks! Yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it, but, you know, it's still gonna cost you $30. Look, I don't hate paid games, they're pretty cool, but when they suck, they really suck. 
it was only five bucks per game and you got your own mini to play with plus a free snack and drink of your choice. So I was more or less sold on joining the campaign. My only other gripe was that there were a total of eight players, including me, which is easily the biggest table I've ever played at. The dungeon master told me he's DM'd for bigger tables before, so that did make me worry a little bit less, but dang, I could not fathom DMing for more than five people. Regardless, I ended up joining the campaign. I was wanting to have something to do on my Fridays off. Game day comes around, and I came in two hours early so I can make my artificer. I was coming in at level 6 since the campaign was ongoing for a few months, so it was a lot to take in for me. Artificer isn't the easiest class to learn, and it was my first time playing one, but I did pull through in time before the session started. During that time, I slowly met the other players, mainly through me asking what class they were and what gear they had so I can pick proper infusions. But then I met Dice, our cleric. Dice was a pretty cool guy, playing D&D since 2nd edition. We joked around and told each other about our shenanigans from past games we were in, and honestly, I was starting to have really high hopes for this campaign, but that hope would turn into worry soon enough. Session 1 starts and I'm introduced mid-combat. My character was named Velio and was looking for a part that my character's master lost when I heard the combat going on near me. So, I summoned my Eldritch Cannon and entered the fray! We were fighting this homebrew creature that I didn't quite remember. I just remember that it had arms and hands everywhere, and it would grapple you on successful attacks, with a chance to save, of course. And it summoned other creatures to the battlefield. It was a cool encounter, except it lasted for the entire session. Now, I like rolling dice for big bonks as much as the next guy, but there was no real opportunity to roleplay or to explore. I know we were in combat, so exploration is instantly gone, but whenever I tried to describe what my character did, no one really seemed too impressed or even seemed to care at all. I kind of felt like I was wasting time a bit. <sighs> I was going to put it in the bits where Liam from Critical Role said, I just cast the spell, because he usually does spell descriptions, but I, I couldn't find. But my point is, spell descriptions are cool. Taking a couple seconds just to give your character some flavor, it adds so much to the game. I felt like I was acting goofy, which isn't entirely how I wrote Velio to be. There were some other problems, however. During the encounter, both Velio and his cannon got hit with a burrow attack, and they both had to make saves. I cast shield to make the attack miss, but my cannon failed and was grappled by this creature, being carried around by the arms of the monster. The problem was that the dungeon master ruled that since the cannon was grappled and couldn't move, it was forced to shoot its ballista in the direction it was facing and couldn't target anything else. I tried to ask why that would inhibit my cannon's attack when the rule states I just choose a target in range but I got shut down. I had to improvise and improvise I did so on my turn I moved further back from the monster and targeted the creature with my cannon in tow. I picked up a rock and threw it and cast catapult and that's where problem two starts. Okay Campbell calls for a deck save or taking 3d8 bludgeoning damage. Actually the creature's gonna fail on purpose. But why? Picture the look of confusion and disbelief on my face when the dungeon master tells me that the creature moved my cannon into the trajectory of my spell and took the damage for him, destroying my cannon. I tried to ask how that's even possible, but I don't quite remember what was said. I just know that the ruling flew and I started to feel dejected from the game. Okay, so you should probably know the sword is really important to my specs class kit. I mean, I can still do stuff without it, but I get really, really weakened without this blade. So I'm gonna make sure to be really careful with it and keep it close. Oh, that's really interesting. Wait, hey! Well, I guess you won't be needing that. What do you mean? I literally just explained how I do need that. Yeah, well, sucks for you, I guess. Besides, you are completely useless in combat anyway. Oh, well, then this is really gonna help. I took my turns without really saying too much, just hoping that the encounter would just finish up. Eventually, the combat was over, and the session was beginning to wrap. Most of us with our paladin going down. The thing about going down, however, is that when you go down, the creature we were fighting could control your body and turn you against the other player characters which is what the paladin had to do, and we didn't take him back down before the creature, which makes this next part all the more bad for the group. The DM asked everyone who was near the creature when it died to roll a dexterity saving throw. Our frontliners were the only ones who had to roll, and everyone but Bob the Barbarian passed. On his failed save, a liquid-like metal bursts from the creature and skewers Bob's character, dealing upwards of 70 damage and killing him outright. I don't know how many hit points he had left before then, but he was a barbarian, so he had to have had high health. 
With that, the barbarian was dead and was turned into a boss level creature that we had to fight next session. I could swear I felt my soul leave my body when I heard the DM say that, and it was only going to get worse from here on out. After the session, I talked to the dungeon master and aired out my grievances with him about some of the rulings that happened during the session. I don't remember everything that was said, but the DM said that he wasn't trying to target me or anything like that, and other stuff too. Our talk did kind of smooth things out a bit, but I was definitely giving myself a headache trying to figure out why he ruled certain things the way he did. The next session wasn't better. Firstly, less people showed up for this session. Wonder why? So we just had less in the action economy than before. We also had this kid who showed up who was annoying as all heck and didn't contribute too much either. Bob was also there, but he didn't roll a new character. Instead, the dungeon master allowed him to play the boss monster that Bob's barbarian turned into. I didn't think too much of this, but this eventually ended up causing more problems. So we started off combat, and our rogue went down immediately. She had only 8 hit points from last session, and she failed a deck save of all things. So we had the boss and two player characters now fighting against us. Off to a great start. It was me, Rochambeau, Dice, and the kid, and our wizard left standing. During our turns, we were strategizing, trying to figure out what we could do to come out on top of this. I recommended that it would probably be best for us to retreat and regroup. We were low on hit points and on resources. The kid agreed with me too, but Dice believed we could do it and so did the others. However, the kid became hell-bent on escaping, saying, We're all gonna die if we stay, or there's no point in fighting every moment that passed by. We all kind of ignored him as the combat went on, but we couldn't ignore what was happening on Kid's turn. Okay, kid, it's your turn. What do you want to do? I'm going to run away from the fight, I'm not getting myself killed, and so the kid left the encounter without a second thought. No one really tried to convince him to stay because of how annoying he was to talk to, so he just bit the bullet and continued the fight without him. Luckily, Dice came in clutch, he cast Spirit Guardians, the fight began to look favorable. We all did our best to support him with whatever we could do, and it was working out really well for us. Then our hopes went up in smoke in a matter of two rounds of combat. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this person says a matter of as if two rounds of combat is a short amount of time, when in reality it was probably what, like 30 to 40 minutes? <laughs> Dice went over the rules for Spirit Guardians and told the Dungeon Master that he could jump in and out of the AoE of Spirit Guardians to make it proc multiple times a turn. That's not how it works! Literally made a whole video about this. Seriously, quit changing the rules for spells to make them overpowered. Breaking the game by changing the rules isn't cool. It's stupid. We were all pretty shocked to hear him say that because it sounded OP. It was also our best shot at coming out of this alive though. So I just looked up the rules before the spell while writing this out and found out that no, it doesn't work like that at all. But the DM was cool with it and let Dice proc Spirit Guardians 3 times a turn, effectively making him the highest damage dealer on the team. Seeing this, Bob, who's controlling the boss, did the same thing with his movement. First, let me explain. The boss that Bob was controlling was a gargantuan creature that apparently had a trample attack that it could use just by moving into the same square as smaller enemies, except they weren't attacks, they were deck saves. And since Dice was right underneath the boss with my cannon, Bob made us roll six deck saves in a row. I tried to argue that I don't think that's how that would work since it's a force save we have to make just because the boss felt like doing the two-step. Can you imagine if your D&D &D character died because the boss started tap dancing next to you? I didn't mind having to make one save, but six? That mechanic was definitely broken as all heck. Needless to say, Dice's cleric was dead alongside my cannon. I could see how frustrated Dice was, and I kinda felt bad. He pretty much put the party on his shoulders, even though it was through an illegal ruling, but I don't think he should've gotten got like that. I tried my best to support him throughout the fight as well as others, but it felt like the efforts went up in smoke when this happened. Eventually, Dice packed up his stuff and just left the session early, and it was up to me, Rochambeau, and our wizard to take down Bob. During this time though, Bob was saying, Hey guys, I told you that if Bob dies, I'm gonna TPK the group and all that. We mentioned that what he did to Bob wasn't cool, and he just shrugged it off saying, If he's gonna cheese movement like that, then why can't I? I'll admit, he kinda has a point that I'll get into later, but I was way more annoyed to really care. At this point, the wizard went down next, it was just me and Rochambeau. Now you're probably wondering what Rochambeau was doing the whole time. Well, I'll tell you, Rochambeau had a magic item that he got before I came along that allowed him to attune to the ground beneath him, and with every turn, he increased that space until it was big enough to completely surround Bob and sunk the boss into the earth like it was quicksand. Meanwhile, I had used my last spell slot to make a protector cannon to give us some temporary hit points. 
Then, Bob's turn came along. He made his deck save against the quicksand and climbed out, making his way towards Rochambeau and I. He then tried to do the same trample BS he did to dice on us, but he only got three attacks since he burned some movement to get to us. Between my roll for temporary hit points and our saves going two out of three and Bob's terrible dice rolls, he did not even break through the temp hit points. On our turns, I dashed out of the area and Rochambeau successfully sunk Bob into the ground again. And so we made our grand escape. We couldn't really save anyone else who was down since we had no healing items or spells, but it didn't matter, really. The campaign was pretty much destroyed, with everyone who had a reason to go along with the main quest dead except for Rochambeau, and he didn't really care about the main quest after that whole fiasco. So that was my second session. I didn't really get to meet the other player characters properly, and my character almost died in the process along with everyone else. Two whole sessions filled with nothing but combat, and this is how it turned out. I wouldn't have minded so much for two sessions, but for one, this was paid D&D. Two, the campaign was virtually over, with no one knowing about or wanting to continue the main quest. The Dungeon Master announced that the next week, we'd run a session zero for a homebrew version of Curse of Strahd! There's no way that could go wrong. Curse of Strahd. Rochambeau and I were welcome with our same characters, since we didn't die. I can't even count how many horror stories I've heard take place in Curse of Strahd, no, see? But I can still play Velio, so I guess that's a win for me. Once again, I talked to the Dungeon Master at the end of the session, this time about the whole thing with Dice and the trampling incident. DM told me that because he let Dice do his whole spirit guardian shenanigans, he couldn't play favorites and not let Bob do the same thing. I do think that that's fair, but I think the best thing to do was to not let Dice do what he did, even if it was rules as written. The Dungeon Master told me that Dice already had some gripes with the group before, so he doesn't think he'll be coming back, which honestly, that kind of sucks. He was pretty much the only person outside the Dungeon Master that tried to talk to me, at least outside of jokes being made mid-session. I don't think he'll come back either, but here's to being hopeful, I guess. As for the boss, the DM told me that the boss only lost half its hit points during the whole encounter, from 300 plus hit points, and could heal from fire damage. I asked him how the heck did he expect us to beat the thing, and he told me that acid damage was its weakness, and literally no one had access to acid damage. Artifacers get acid splash as a cantrip, but I never took it. Plus, not only was our wizard centered around fire damage, but he never learned chromatic orb either. Honestly, I was just lucky enough to keep my character alive. As for myself, I think I'll stick around a bit more and try out this Curse of Strahd campaign. Who hurt you? Why didn't it stick? I don't think the table is as bad as some who might think this would be, but I'll be keeping my eyes peeled for any more red flags. Hopefully I don't have to type out another one of these, but I'll keep you updated if the situation somehow gets worse. Wish me luck. Look, the DM could be a wonderful person, but this is rough. I mean, this encounter design is just straight up bad. I don't know what level you guys are at, but a 300 plus hit point boss, I mean, I don't know. This party just doesn't seem like the right level for something with that much meat on the bones. Also, I freaking despise when DMs are like, Ooh, the boss was healing from fire damage the whole time without ever telling the party that that's what's going on. That's stupid, okay? You should at least communicate on some level that the boss is benefiting from the fire damage you're dealing. It is way better for the players to be punished for things they're aware of than for stuff you never told them about. Also, player bosses are so hard to pull off, and doing that for a first-time player and in a paid game? Oh my god, it's just... It's just not the play, man. This DM isn't a psychotic incel or a homophobic bigot, and I'm sure they're a nice person, but this is a bad D&D session. <laughs> really, really unflattering, especially if you're paying for it. If I was joining that Curse of Strahd game, I'd require it to be the best D&D session I've ever played, because if I don't have something to make up for this, I ain't sticking around. In fact, I'd probably be bailing a heck of a lot earlier. All right, and that's a wrap. If you guys enjoyed them, please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Q&Play series, where we answer your questions in a rambly, unscripted format while playing some video games. We just released a new episode. It's linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment against the barbarian to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can send them directly to us. There's an email down in the description down below. Send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.